First uh, Thessalonians chapter four, starting in verse 13. Paul writes, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare from the word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Well, as you know, we've been studying this summer uh, through this letter, 1 Thessalonians, that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And this was a a church that he had planted. Uh, He was there for maybe a few months, uh, but not very long. And so he has sent Timothy, one of his disciples, one of the guys he's training up, to go back and check on this church, see if they have any questions, to see how they're doing and report back to him. And uh, one of the things, the questions that Paul relays back, or Timothy relays back to Paul upon his return is this, that's answered in the text we're looking at today. He said, they said, they want to know what happens to the Christians uh, who have already died before Christ returns. Um, the church at that time, they were really kind of living with this expectant hope of Christ returning. Um, Paul had taught, even in the short time he was there, he had taught the imminent return of Christ, um, but they were kind of expecting more of an immediate return. And today it's funny, like we have the opposite problem. Like we, we know that he's coming back and we've heard it so many times that we don't really live expectantly. We don't even act like it's imminent. Uh, and so today I hope that's, that'll be one byproduct of this message is that we'll know and look forward to the fact that, that Christ is coming back and that we have some awesome things to look forward to in that. Uh, it's not just something we hear about in Sunday school, but it is, it's good and it is our hope in Christ's return. Um, let's look now kind of line by line through this passage and just see what the scripture says to support it. Paul says in verse 13 here, he says, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Paul had covered a lot of ground with the church during those few months. Um, he had taught on Christ's ret- return, um, but he hadn't um, been able to teach on this specific point. So they were still uninformed. The, the word literally means they were ignorant. They didn't know. And uh, I think all of us have been there. There've been things that, that we just don't know. Um, it's funny when you're kind of preparing a message like this, sometimes an illustration gets uh, dropped in your lap. And this week we had like a $600 illustration uh, get dropped in our lap. Uh, it was Sunday or Monday and we were washing clothes and we went to check on the clothes to see if they're ready to put in the dryer. And the, the washer was like three quarters full of water. You guys have had this happen probably. And uh, so I get on YouTube and I'm like, man, you could, they'll show you how to fix anything now. So I got on there, I watched probably 10 videos and I'm like, all right, I can do this. Kelly and I tipped it over. We drain out the water through the hose into buckets, bucket after bucket. And uh, that totally works by the way. So just look at YouTube. And I thought what happened before when we had a service man come out and fix it was a sock had gotten stuck in the pump at the bottom there. And uh, I'm like, I can figure this out. So I take the pump off. I even took a video to show Kelly because she was asleep at this point. I wanted to prove to her that I was a handyman. Um, and I was so convinced I was going to fix it, but you know, I couldn't fix it and it didn't work and there was no sock. So I finally get it all put back together, which was the hardest part, plug it back in, didn't work. So we came to the decision, we could either pay someone maybe $100, $200 to try and fix it, um, or for, you know, five or $600, we could just buy a new one. So we did that, and yesterday we get it in, plugged up, connected, plugged in, and push start on it, and it doesn't work, it doesn't do anything. And we're like, what in the world? Well, uh, these new houses, they put like a GFI outlet, but instead of being like in the bathroom and in the kitchen and all throughout the house, there's one centrally located in the house. And it was upstairs in our bathroom. So I go and I push that like I tried before. That didn't do anything. So finally, I go out to the fuse panel in the garage. And, uh, and that's the key there, checking the fuse box. And I open it up kind of hesitantly and I look in and sure enough, there's this one little switch that's flipped the opposite way, the red showing. And it's for a dedicated circuit, it says washer. And I was like, man. And I, I sheepishly went in and told Kelly, I was like, um, this, uh, this flip was switched for the washer. And so it could be that our, our washer that we had that we replaced that's now sitting on the curb might actually work. So we ran an extension cord out to it and long story short, we're convinced that uh, that washer needed to be replaced. That's at least what we're telling ourselves. And, um, but knowing is important. 
Uh, on a more serious note, for me, there was one thing I just remember learning. Um, it was like 2009, Steve Idle was doing a series on the Holy Spirit called Filled here. And uh, for probably eight or nine weeks, he talked about just nuts and bolts stuff about who the Holy Spirit is, how he works, what he wants to do through us. And I remember it changed how I prayed. It changed how I thought about God. It changed, um, I think I used to rely on myself to kind of try and do God's work. And I realized that he lives in me. We don't have to pray and ask him to be here with us because he lives in us. And that if I'll surrender to him and ask him to fill me and use me, that he'll actually do the work and I can kind of relax, stop striving and let him work through me. And that changed everything. I was ignorant to the truth about the Spirit, and then I learned the truth. In the same way, these guys in Thessalonica, they didn't know the truth. Um, So keep reading. we got to keep listening. we got to keep discussing truth. They didn't know, and because they didn't know and they hadn't heard, they had no hope in this matter. But Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. We're transformed by the renewing of our minds. So Paul says here in verse 13, he says that we should not grieve as if we have no hope. He doesn't say don't grieve. So, so hear me say that. Grieving is good. Grieving is okay. He doesn't say don't grieve. He says don't grieve as if you have no hope like the world. And I can say with 100% certainty that grieving is fine. We even see Christ in Scripture. It says Jesus wept, right? That's the shortest verse you probably memorized when you're five. You know, I know a verse, Jesus wept. Um, when Lazarus died, uh, Jesus wept because he saw the pain that it called Mar- caused Mary and Martha and his other friends. But... That was temporary. He didn't grieve without hope because then Lazarus was resurrected. He came out of the tomb. So we grieve not as people that have no hope, but we grieve as people who do have hope. And Titus 2.13 calls our hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't really feel like I can speak uh, very well through experience the suffering or the pain of losing a loved one or a close family member because uh, I haven't had to yet. And, um, but I know that there's several of you in this congregation that have, um, just about everybody has. And I know that if you ask those who hope in Christ, they would say that, yes, it hurts. Yes, it's painful. Uh, yes, they miss their father or their mother or their daughter or their children, uh, their loved ones. But there's clearly something different in the way they grieve, in their sorrow. There's a hope. They find their peace in Christ and his promise that he is and he will make all things new. They know they'll see their family again one day. Hebrews 6, 19 says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Um, One thing I want to say that's not as fun, um, if those loved ones that pass away aren't in Christ, they don't know Christ, uh, we don't have the same hope that we'll see them. Um, So that's why we got to tell people. Uh, I just want to encourage you with that. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until they're in the hospital. Um, You know, that's tough, but... That's the reality. That's life and death. We, gotta, we want people to know Christ and have that relationship with him for eternity. Jesus taught in John 5, 25, he said, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So at first Jesus is talking about spiritually going from death to life. But then he says in John 5, 28, just a few verses later, do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So we will be resurrected. But what's even cooler than that is that it's just our bodies that are gonna have to await the resurrection until he returns. Our spirit, the word teaches, goes immediately to be with God. There's not a state of limbo or like soul sleep or purgatory if you kind of grew up in a Catholic background. Uh, There's none of that. Once we die, if we belong to Christ, our spirit is with God. Paul clearly looked forward to being with Christ. He said in Philippians, um, what is it, 1, 21 through 24, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, if I'm going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor, labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it's more necessary for you that I remain here in the body. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 says, So we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, that we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we're of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So truth here we see is for a Christ follower, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible actually teaches, and this this is going to be new to some of us, the Bible teaches that our bodies return to the dust from which they were created. Our spirit, though, returns to the God who gave it. 
And if this sounds weird, just listen to a few of these passages that explain it. Uh, Genesis 2, 7 talks about how we're created. It says, then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, breathed the spirit into him. And the man became a living creature. Genesis 3, 19, God says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken and for you were dust and to dust you will return. And then we see it again in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. It says, for we know that if this tent, that's what Paul calls our body, a tent, our earthly home is destroyed, then we have a building from God, a house that's not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. And Paul teaches later in this letter, we'll see in chapter five, verse 23. He, t- he tells us that we're made up of spirit and soul and body, that we've got these three separate parts, yet they're all together and make up who we are. Um, George McDonald, who C.S. Lewis quotes a lot, uh, he says, you don't have a soul. In fact, you are a soul and you have a body. It's a different perspective for us. So our body, our tent will go into the ground, but our spirit and our soul will return to be with God. All right, let's look at verse 14 here. And I just want you to notice the word choices that Paul makes. Verse 14, he says, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. All right, we've got died, we've got asleep. So the key word Paul uses here is asleep. People who go to sleep, they're gonna wake up again. 99 times out of 100, when we go to sleep, we wake up again. So sleep, as we all know, is temporary. Paul says we're asleep. So yes, we grieve when we lose family and friends for this life, but at the same time, we have a hope knowing that we haven't lost them because we know where they are. When you know where something is, it's not lost. Uh, I saw this, I was reading last night and I saw in Luke, um, it was talking about the people come to to Jesus and they want him to come and help with Jairus' daughter who's sick and dying. And before he can even get there, uh, the same people run to him and say, stop, don't waste your time, don't come, she's already dead, it's too late. But Jesus goes on and he he goes into a room. Before he goes in, he sees these people outside just crying, bitterly weeping. And he says, stop wailing. She's not dead, but asleep. And they laugh at him. They're like, of course she's dead. Like he has no clue. But he goes in, he takes Peter, James, and John and he goes in with the girl's parents and she comes out alive again. And the Bible says uh, that her spirit returned to her. So it's so cool as I'm reading this, like these things that I kind of had an image of and kind of had an understanding of or been clarified as I just read more and more scripture that it says it the same way, that our spirit returned to her. So when we die, our spirit departs, our body's going to the ground. Um, There's a hope for us that comes from seeing our family members again, but ultimately our hope lies in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel and it's what all of Christianity hinges on. It's Jesus' death, burial, and the resurrection. Paul says, I pass this on to you as a first importance, primary importance. And in Romans, Paul calls the gospel, the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. So if we have any doubt still as to the importance of the resurrection for our faith, Paul goes on and removes it all in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19, where he says, and if Christ has not been raised, if none of this is true, if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. They haven't been atoned for, they haven't been covered. And then those who also have fallen asleep, same language of sleep there in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope for this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. See, the power for Christ followers is found in an empty grave because in his resurrection, 2 Timothy 1.10 tells us that Christ Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel abolished death and he brought life through his death and resurrection. So don't miss this key distinction Paul makes in verse 14, where he writes that, yes, Jesus died, but that we sleep. Jesus died. He faced separation from God the Father for a short time um, so that we never have to be separated from God the Father for eternity. He died so that there's no reason for us to fear death. He wants us to know that for us, the grave is not even close to the end. I love this quote from John Bryson. Uh, He's the founding pastor of Fellowship Memphis. It's this church in Memphis. And uh, he says, be all in. Live your life in such a way that if the dead bones of Jesus were found and Christianity all of a sudden proven to be a sham, you would look like the world's number one idiot. Wasn't that cool? Like 
we should live our life so sold out to this gospel, so sold out to his mission, that if somehow it was proven not true, like we should look foolish. And we see that throughout the Bible, like we should, we should live as people who look different than the world. Um, but I'm not sure we always do that. Life on earth is short. James describes it as a mist and a vapor. Uh, Peter says a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. Isaiah says the sky will vanish and the earth one day will wear out. Psalms 144 says that it's all a fleeting shadow. Peter says all flesh is like grass that withers. And 1 Peter 2.11 calls us foreigners and exiles on earth. Hebrews 13.14 says this world is not our home. But we don't live that way. We tend to live like this world is all there is. We store it for retirement. We collect treasures on earth. We live for comfort just like the rest of the world. And we tend to sleep on God's mission for us. We all fall into this trap, I think, in one way or another. And I know, uh, you know, I'm the chief of sinners in this. I do the same thing. So the Bible tells us that a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. And he calls our bodies tents. So we establish that. So if we really were living the way God wants us to live, our lives would look a lot more like a camping trip than a bunch of people chasing the American dream, right? When you go camping, uh, you take just what you need for the trip. You need a tent, a backpack, some cooking supplies, some food, some water, maybe some toilet paper. But you don't take much more than that because the more you take, the less you can do, the less freedom that you have. The more you have, the more you have to manage. I'm not sure who said it, whether it was Alan or Steve Smith that told me this, but they said everything you own can own a piece of you. This trip that we're on, uh, it really is temporary, but our tents are decked out with all the best stuff. We've got to have the thinnest surround on our flat screens. We've got to have 4K HD. Uh, we've got to have a brand new Keurig because the one we got for Christmas might have mold in it, right? Uh, we got Christmas in July and Amazon Prime Day, which is that a brand new thing? I just heard of that this week. Um, and even our watches are connected, but you and I make little time to connect with the God who made us too many times. And again, I'm the worst of this, but it's something that every one of us need to wrestle with. Do we live like God wants us to? Do we have this relationship? He just, he just wants a relationship with his children. He just wants our attention and our time. And it's gonna look different and lived out for all of us. Uh, but if he's not our main focus, we need to make some changes and we need to do it today. So ask God today, spend some time with him and ask him, where do my priorities really lie, God? Where's your focus? If our focus is only on this earth, then when we face death, or even if we face the loss of our stuff, it's gonna shake us to the core. But if our focus is on Jesus, when we encounter death or hardships, or even when our own lives are threatened, we won't be thrown off mission. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says, therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light, this is what he calls them, light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, everything down here, but we fix our eyes on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When uh, Roger Udarian and Pete Fleming, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and Emma Coley were attacked by the Wudani, uh, the Alka Indians, that they had spent years trying to get the gospel to, they actually were armed. They had guns on them but they had decided uh, months and months, maybe years in advance, that they would not use a gun uh, on one of these um, Alka Indians because they knew Christ, but the Alkas did not. Jim Elliott famously wrote, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Jim and the other men gave up their lives at the end of Alka Spears and years later gained brothers for eternity when many in the Alka tribe, including some of the men who killed them, chose to follow Christ because the family members of the men never stopped working and praying for their salvation. That's actually a picture behind me of uh, one of the men who actually speared this guy's father, um, Nate Saint. And this man's uh, son actually views this man, the Alka Indian, as a grandfather. And so it's just an awesome story. If you guys have never heard that story, look it up, Wikipedia, uh, rent um, the movie Through the Gates of Splendor. Uh, but it's amazing. God is so good. So it just teaches us our focus really does determine our perspective. If we don't seek him first, we're going to share the world's perspective by default and we'll view death as the end instead of as it really is, the beginning of glory. 
Well, back to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 15 says, for this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. That means God has revealed it to Paul, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Now it's, it's important to know that in the Old Testament for all these feasts and these big festivals they had, even when they called people to battle, the trumpets were the, were the signal for them to gather. And so same for us, we'll be signaled with this trumpet sound to gather with Christ. It says the dead in Christ will rise first. Then verse 17, then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That's awesome, always, always with him. Nothing can separate us from him. So this is the rapture. And uh, one of the reasons I just wanted to take this like a Bible study and just see what the word says today and really dive into it is because this isn't something I've heard preached on a whole lot. You know, we kind of know about the rapture. We've heard about it, uh, but it's not really, it's not one you'd probably pick to preach on, even though the truth of it is it's awesome, uh, but it's kind of a technical deal. And some people will try and argue against the rapture. Maybe, you know, the word rapture, they'll say is not in scripture, uh, but it really is. The Greek word here that we get the words caught up from in verse 17 is harpazo, uh, which just means to catch up or to grasp hastily, to snatch, to lift, or to rapture. Uh, And the word that was translated in the Latin version in the Bible um, is rapturo. And that's where we get the English word rapture. So it's in there. If if you'd rather prefer to call it harpazo, uh, be my guest. Uh, But there definitely will be a rapture when Jesus returns and we will be called and lifted up to meet him in the air. There's further evidence for the rapture found um, in Jesus' ascension in Acts 1.11. He's there on the mount. Uh, they were told the disciples to meet in Galilee. He's given the great commission and he goes up and he disappears in the clouds. And then these two men, these angels are standing there and they say, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way that he went into heaven. And just like it's the premise of the movie Left Behind, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 40 through 41 that, Two men will be in the field and one will be taken and one will be left. And he says, two women will be at the meal grinding and one will be taken up and one will be left, right? Left behind. But unlike the movie, when he comes back, I don't have any doubt that we're all gonna know what happened, right? In the movie, they're kind of like, what, what just happened here? I think we're gonna know. No one knows the day or the hour, but we're not gonna miss it like the Thessalonians feared they might have. I can't imagine um, what it's gonna look like on that day, but um, I know it's gonna look so much more impressive than, than this crazy storm that rolled into Lexington on Monday afternoon. That was our backyard. And actually I had to crank up the contrast and the brightness on this picture, but it was like 3 p.m., right? And it turned completely black outside. How much crazier is it gonna be when Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, who, who helps speak the world into existence, the universe, he comes back to earth. Luke 17, 24, Jesus says himself, he says, as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. So if we're living when Christ returns, we will be taken up to meet him in the sky, but it won't precede those uh, who have died before. They will return with Christ in their resurrected bodies. All right, time out. So these people are dead. Their bodies have been in the ground, their temporal body. Uh, Does that mean like they're gonna be rotten corpses or there's gonna be like a zombie apocalypse kind of deal? No, all right? rest of these. Um, It's going to be the furthest thing from that. Not only are our bodies resurrected, but we're going to be transformed into Jesus's very likeness. And the theological term for this, you might may have heard people talk about is glorification. We're going to be made like him. Uh, First John 3, 2 talks about this. John says, dear friends, now we're children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So, there's a sudden transformation. There's also this gradual transformation called sanctification. We see that described in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed. It's, it's this ongoing process into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. All right, so there's ongoing transformation. And then again, we see the sudden final transformation that takes place in an instant when we encounter Christ will be made perfect at this moment. This will be glorification. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15 just totally describes it awesomely. Um, I'd encourage every, everyone to just go home and read that whole chapter today, 1 Corinthians 15. We're gonna look here at verse 50 through 57. Paul says, I tell you brothers, flesh and blood, these bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God, 
nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But behold, I'll tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. There's that sleep word again. But we'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. So that's where we get that. It says the dead will be raised imperishable in those new glorified bodies. And we, we who are alive, will be changed, will be transformed and glorified. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. See, God really is making everything new. Right now, creation uh, literally groans for redemption because the fall has affected everything in life. Sin has entered the world and it's wreaking havoc. But one day the Bible says in Revelation that there'll be no more crying, no more tears, no more pain, no more death. C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory, he describes our glorified state in this way. He says, remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person, and I'm sorry if that's me, if you have to talk to me, I'm boring. Um, Remember that the dullest person you meet one day, they may be a creature that if you saw them now, you would be strongly tempted to fall down and worship. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 through 49 says that the first man, he's talking about Adam, uh, was from the earth. He was a man of dust. But the second man, Jesus, is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we, is, we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So we're definitely gonna be made like him when we see him, believe that. We are co-heirs with Christ. The Bible says we're his sons and daughters. Um, I've been listening to this worship album by Kurt Vernon the uh, past couple of weeks. And he's, in it, this prayer, he says um, that God wants to turn us all into identical twins of his sons. And I, out of his son. And I love that prayer. You know, how cool is that? That he wants us, he wants to make us look and act and be in every way like Christ. And he's doing that now through sanctification. And one day he will transform us in an instant uh, to be like Christ. How undeserving we are of that and, and what grace there is in that is amazing. That's his plan. He wants to restore creation to perfection. And he also wants to restore us to this perfect relationship with him. In fact, the only thing that I can see that won't be perfect, that will steal bear the marks of the fall uh, in eternity is the scars on Jesus' hands. So if we're asleep when he returns, if we, if we passed on, um, our bodies will be resurrected in a glorified state and will return with Christ. But if we're alive when he returns, we'll be raptured. We'll call up to meet him and transformed in an instant into our glorified bodies in that order. And then the last verse uh, in chapter four, verse 18 Paul says, and this is important, he says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. See, God tells us what's coming, um, not only to kind of warn us, but mainly for our encouragement. Prophecy is always meant primarily for the encouragement of God's people. And we've looked at a lot of scripture today about Jesus' return, and we haven't even scratched the surface of when exactly kind of will, it will fall on that timeline of the end times. And uh, that fits in better with being in chapter five. So if Monty wants that, uh, I'll let him explain all that to you. And, um, but the only thing I want to say about all that is just to, to offer comfort to you. Um, throughout scripture, sometimes God doesn't explain things clearly. He doesn't say it's going to be exactly like this or exactly like that. But he gives us, especially in the Old Testament, all these pictures of his character, about who he is, what he's like, what he does. And so I think we can find comfort in examples like the flood, um, where God told Noah and his family to build the ark. And he, he made this way out for them. They had to go through the waters, uh, but he shut the door, he protected them, and he brought them through to dry land. Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, when it met its judgment, God told them ahead of time, he told Lot and his family, and he said, leave and don't look back. And I think in the same way, we're seeing more and more that the signs um, that his return is getting closer. So be encouraged. One, that he's coming back for us. And two, be encouraged to live with a sense of urgency, not fear, but urgency. Because you know that this window of opportunity we have to reach those we love and those we care about and maybe those we haven't even met yet is narrowing by the day. In Luke 21, 25 through 28, uh, this section from uh, this, the Olivet Discourse, it's uh, in Matthew 24 as well. 
Jesus tells us to look, um, what to look for concerning his second coming. And this is, this is good stuff and it's in red letters. Jesus says himself, there will be signs and sun and moon and stars and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and the waves. People will be fainting with fear and with foreboding what's coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the son of man coming in a cloud with great power and glory. Now, when all these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads up because your redemption is drawing near. Jesus warns us and he tells us, he's encouraging us. It's gonna get worse. It may be worse than we can even imagine. And it won't be easy. It'll be difficult, but know that God will come for his people. He always makes a way out. And when things are the darkest, that's when Christ and his church tend to shine the brightest. So be ready, be ready to shine in the darkness. And uh, please, if you aren't already following Christ, and following Christ doesn't mean just uh, saying a prayer once in your life or raising your hand. Following Christ means submitting uh, all of your life to his lordship, trusting in him and not your own goodness uh, for salvation. It means knowing him. It means a relationship with him. If you don't understand that, figure that out. Come down uh, at the end of this, pray with somebody, talk to somebody, have that conversation with somebody you know can help you down that path um, because we're talking about eternity uh, and it's that important. Don't find yourself unprepared for his coming. I was reading this Wednesday um, after I put all this on paper and um, I, I've just been blown away this week by how cool the word is, how good God's word is. It supports and it connects and it upholds and it just confirms what he says. He'll say it one place and it says it exactly the same in another place, another place. And uh, it's just really built my faith up even more this week, seeing how good his word is. So I wanna finish by reading this from Philippians 3 to you. And I just read it, I was like, man, this is exactly what we've been studying. Paul writes, he says, but whatever gain I had, I now count as loss for the sake of Christ. He says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish, trash, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, what I can do, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I might know him, that's the key, know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering, somehow becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, that I might attain the resurrection from the dead. This resurrection, this meeting with Christ, uh, this is a big deal. This is Paul talking and he is, uh, he's seeking this as a goal. Verse 12, not that I've already attained all this or am already made perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward toward what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That sounds a lot like the rapture. That comes a lot like him coming and calling us home. Verse 17, he says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. For many, many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even through tears, they walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach and they glory in their shame because their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a savior the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. And this is so cool, it ties it all together. Chapter four, verse one, therefore my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Would you guys pray with me? Father God, um, Lord, I just pray if there's anyone that doesn't know you, this morning, God. Uh, anyone that's not having that relationship with you, who hasn't made the decision to follow you, God, would you just stir in their hearts and that they would have a conversation, that they would come down and pray, that they would, they would not let a day go by because uh, we don't know when you're gonna return, Lord. And that's not a scary tactic, God, but that's being prepared. And we're talking about eternity, God. This life is so short, eternity is long. Uh, God, you're so good. They don't know what they're missing out on, Lord. So would you draw us to yourself today? God, would you give us more and more confidence in your word that we would desire to seek you like gold and silver? Lord Jesus, uh, I pray that right now, anyone who wants to make a decision, God, that they would not 
uh, be held back by fear, God. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word, the way you reveal yourself to us and your truth, God. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, there'll be people down front if you wanna come and pray. Um, and uh, the altar is always open. Love you guys. And don't let anything hold you back from making that decision today.